Now we have a talk from Piotr uh, Piet Primus. <laughs> Difficult name, sorry. Sorry, Piet. Um, everything you always want to know about Python, uh, no, about memory in Python. So, um, yeah, but we're afraid to ask. I think, have fun, and I give the word to Piet. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, at the beginning, I have to say that's bad news for you. Uh, it won't cover all the topics about Python memory because the, the subject is uh, too complex and I had to choose something. But I will try to do my best and probably I will run out of time. And so if you have any questions, uh, please catch me during the lunch, and after lunch I'm going back home. So, okay, so a few words about me. Uh, I'm still a PhD student, and I work as a uh, research assistant at uh, Nikolaus Copernicus University. My uh, main interests and scientific interests are databases and GPGPU computing. I try to combine these two. And also I did some, some uh, stuff with uh, data mining. Uh, I have at least eight years of Python experience. And I did some uh, projects with, uh, with Python. I list here uh, three of them. Uh, so I was working with, uh, I, I was responsible for preparing parts of uh, a trading platform for uh, an asset management uh, company. It was mostly backtesting and trading algorithms. I also was responsible for preparing a uh, muscle biomonitoring analysis and data mining software for uh, laboratory use. And now we are thinking about commercializing it. And for my PhD thesis, I prepared a simulator of heterogeneous processing environment for evaluation database query scheduling algorithms. And I mentioned these uh, projects here uh, on purpose because all of them had something in common. They all were, they all were uh, memory intensive, they were long running, <coughs> Uh, and during these uh, computations, they tend to grow with memory. And at some point, I, did, I decided that I have to know something more about how the Python manages the memory and what are the sizes of, of, uh, of uh, different types and what are the strategies for allocating uh, different containers. Uh, so this will be mentioned in the first two uh, sections. And later, I will try to say a few things about memory profiling tools. So let's start. Here's some basic stuff. I have a C, C++ background, and I also teach uh, this language to students. And after, I don't know, first two months, they already know what are the sizes of different types in, uh, in C or C++. And in Python, this knowledge isn't uh, required for you. So actually, you, uh, you, do, you, you, can, you don't even have to care about what, what is the size until some point. When your application is large enough and it uh, allocates a lot of memory, then you, you start to think about it, what, is the, what are the sizes of different Python types. So I won't go in, in, with details with this table, I'll just show you some interesting stuff. Uh, okay, you have one of interesting stuff is that uh, long uh, in Py2 and uh, int in Python3 are actually limited by your memory. Uh, so as far as you have uh, enough memory, you can, you can allocate large enough number. And you have to also note that uh, these types are pretty large if you compare them to, uh, to uh, C or C++. Uh, but that's because there is another, there is an overhead of uh, garbage collector and other things. And it's also no, worth to note uh, how the strings and unicodes uh, are represented in memory. So we have a pretty large header, and we also have to pay two uh, bytes for each element uh, in your string on Unicode. The same goes for tuples, where you actually have a, uh, even a larger he uh, header, and you have to pay four and eight bytes for each element. So you can do it yourself. Uh, from Python to 6, you have sys get size of, and you can put anything in there, and you'll get size in bytes uh, with some restrictions. So uh, all the built uh, in uh, objects will return your correct results. But if you use some uh, third-party uh, libraries, uh, it might be 
it might return some crazy stuff, so be aware of that. And uh, actually it calls the size of method and it will add the additional garbage collector overhead uh, if the object is managed by the garbage collector. So let's do something more interesting. Uh, here is a fun example, because creating of lists is fun. Uh, here we create uh, two lists with the same size, and here we create we will create uh, numbers with uh, with this formula, and here is exactly the same number plus something more. Do you think that there will be any difference between allocate, uh, memory allocated for be uh, between listing one and listing two? So this is a fun example. So yes, there should be some difference. And as you can see, uh, the size of the first uh, list is actually less than half of the of the second one. So this is because of object interning. So what's that? Uh, so okay, in Python, there is a general rule for creating objects. So when we create object and assign it to uh, to a var variable, uh, so this object is created and uh, and assigned. So we uh, the, vari the variables just, just point to this object, so they do not hold the memory. And interning of objects is an exception to this rule. It's mainly due to the performance optimizations uh, uh, done in, uh, uh, in uh, Python, and it's highly implementation specific. All the examples from this presentation are from CPython, and actually uh, it might change o over time, and there was at least one change in the Python implementation about object interning uh, during the time. So, uh, what is the, the, the interning of objects? So, often used objects are pre allocated, and instead of creating every time that we, I don't know, uh, say A uh, equals zero, so the zero won't be created all the time, it will be, uh, it will be shared among all the instances. So, here we have the code that will uh, that uh, visualize this. So here we assign zero to A and B, and if you write A is B, we will get true, and of course value is also true. And here in this example, uh, you can see that we assigned the, a large number, and uh, A is B will return you false, and the values are of course the same. Actually, I, uh, someone showed me an amazing test uh, from two days ago, and there was similar question there, but but uh, still, this is highly Python implementation specific. So, let's talk about something more about the object interning. Uh, first of all, warning. Uh, this is, I will say this once more. This is Python implementation dependent. This may change in future and probably will. Uh, this is not documented in the Python documentation for programmers. Uh, if you want to reference for those, uh, those uh, values here, you have to consult the source code. Okay, so in CPython 2.7 to 3.4, uh, we got uh, inter object interning for integers from this range. Uh, we'll also have uh, object interning for strings and Unicode in Python 2 and Python 3, and Unicode and strings in Python uh, 2 and Python 3. And uh, the interning will be for empty strings and all strings that are length, that that's the length of them is uh, equal one. And with the restriction for the Unicode for only the Latin one uh, symbols. And also uh, empty tuple uh, is another example of object that will be shared among. Okay, now something uh, a little bit different, but still interning. It's string interning. So we start with a simple example. We will create two strings, almost the same. Here we will add the missing letter to the A and try if it's the same. And we will get false, of course. But if we use intern, this is for Python 2, uh, and try this one, and we will get true. So uh, let's try to use it for something evil. We'll create a large list with uh, those strings, and as we can see, we got uh, 57 megabytes of memory, resident memory used. 
And if we do the same with the intern here, we actually reduce the memory usage. But what's actually happening when we use intern? So string interning, this is almost Wikipedia definition, it's a method for storing uh, only one copy of each distinct string, but we have to remember that they should be immutable. So for um, Python 2 and Python 3, we have a function intern, and in Python 3 it was relocated to the sys module, so we have sys intern, and uh, if we use this function, we'll actually enter a string into the table of internet strings, uh, we'll get a reference to the internet string. It might, might actually be the same string if it was already interned, or it might be a copy of the string. And when can we use it? So we can get, uh, this also from documentation, we can get uh, a little performance on dictionary lookups. Uh, and some of uh, Python names will be automatically in internet, so for uh, in programs, and actually the dictionaries that hold module, class, and instance of attributes have internet keys. Uh, and as the previous example, we can also reduce the, a little bit reduce the space used when we, if we have a lot of uh, same strings in our code. Okay. So let's say something more about uh, mutable containers. Uh, there are different mutable containers in Python, list, set, dictionaries, and uh, actually behind the scenes there is a strategy for allocating these uh, containers. So uh, a good strategy will try to prepare for growth or shrinkage. So to prepare for growth, we'll slightly over allocate the memory. So each time we append an element to a list, we won't have to relocate the memory uh, in, in, your, in our system. Uh, so we leave the room for growth, and uh, we also have to remember that sometimes we have to shrink the allocated memory for, uh, for uh, a mutable container. Uh, so this will reduce the number of uh, expensive function calls like reloc, man, copy, and so on. And of course, we will we'll try to use an optimal layout for performance reasons. So let's start with a very, very simple example. Uh, this is a list. Uh, first time we put an element for, uh, in, into the list, we'll get an allocation, but not for one element, but for four elements. And after that, if we append something or change something in the list, we'll, we'll have a free append. So it's memory operations free. So we'll have to, can put, we can put another element, another element, and another element. When we put fifth element, we have to, we have to realloc. So the uh, Python will relocate the array for, for our list and uh, we'll prepare with four more elements. So how does it exactly work? So lists in Python are, repre as, are represented as fixed length array of pointers. So we just point to, to objects. Uh, and uh, by design, it will uh, over allocate the, uh, the list. So at the beginning, it will be something like that. But for large lists, uh, it will be less than this percentage. Uh, so OK, some consideration about performance due to memory uh, actions involved uh, when using lists. We actually, uh, when we uh, put something at the end of the, of the list, this is, these operations will be cheap. But if we put something in the middle of, or in the beginning, we will have to copy the memory or shift the memory to uh, perform this operation. Uh, it is also no worth to note that uh, for one, two, and five elements lists, we, lo we waste a lot of space. So if we have a large number of small lists, we'll have to allocate, over allocate for more elements. Okay. Uh, and when is the, here's the overhead of, uh, for allocating arrays and you have to pay this price for each element for, t uh, for different architectures and the shrinkage of the lists will happen when the, uh, alloc the number of elements that we use uh, will go below the half of the allocated space. Okay, let's uh, talk about allocating for dictionaries and sets. It's pretty similar, uh, but here we'll over, uh, we, we will over-allocate when we reach the two-thirds of capacity 
of a dictionary or set. Actually, uh, for small dictionaries and small, uh, small sets, we'll quadruple the capacity in uh, when the set and or leak is uh, big enough, we'll double the capacity to not exceed the memory. Then we'll have to calculate actual used size for, for uh, this object and allocate the memory. And the shrinkage of the dictionary uh, or set will happen when we delete a lot, the, uh, the, uh, remove the lar large number of keys uh, from it. Uh, okay, so uh, another example, we can uh, represent data in var uh, various data represented uh, in different ways. So we can use old style class, new style class, we can use slots, we can use name tuples, tuples, lists, and dictionary data. And I recreated an uh, example from, I don't know, to, uh, PyCon 2010 for, for current versions of Python, but I added uh, more objects and added some more fields. Uh, and actually you can see how the, the, they differ for storing the same data just by defining different types. So as you can see with uh, some restrictions, because if, when you put uh, uh, slots into your class, you've got a lot of restrictions for this class, but you can gain a... Uh, memory uh, minimization boost for, you, you get um, um, less memory used for, for those, those uh, classes. Okay, some notes on garbage corrector and reference count in Python. So actually, as you probably you all know, uh, Python has a garbage collector and it will collect uh, objects when the reference count goes to zero. There are some, uh, some operations that will increment the reference counter, some, there are some uh, operations that will decrement the, operation, uh, the reference counter, but there is a warning and it, it's uh, put in the, the, in, into the official documentation that if you actually uh, uh, overload Dell method, uh, you can have problems because if you have, because Python garbage collector currently can uh, deal with uh, cycles uh, in, uh, in object references, but when you use Dell method, it's not possible for Python to guess the correct order of uh, using the Dell methods for the objects in uh, so in the cycle. So actually, uh, this cycle won't be uh, deallocated from from your memory. Okay, I have some more time, so I'll talk about uh, some tools uh, that you can use for uh, Python pro memory profiling. Uh, let's start with uh, PSUtil. It's pretty simple. It's actually cross-platform system for uh, API for uh, system utilities. And uh, actually to get some information about current process memory, you can just use uh, the PSUtil process, uh, get, your, get PIT of your process and transform this information into a dictionary and then uh, you can return those simple informations. Uh, for mo most of the examples, I just use the, the code because it's, it's most reliable for, for, test, for this test, uh, purpose. And uh, another tool is Memory Profiler, and uh, it recommends to use PSUtils, so uh, it's good to have the PSUtil as a dependency, it will work faster. And uh, uh, memory profiler might work in uh, three different modes. So you can get a line-by-line -line profiler, you can get memory usage mon monitor, and uh, you can pre uh, use it as a debugger trigger. So let's start with a uh, line-by-line -line profiler. You have to put in your code a uh, profile the curator on the function you want to profile, and then you can run it like with something like that. Of course, here should be the name of the, uh, of, of the code. And then you will get such result that you will get line by line memory usage and the increment from, from the memory usage for each line. And here we see that the, the for loop is the, the, the main uh, me memory contributor. And the second way that we can use uh, memory profiler is by uh, using it as, it as uh, memory usage monitor in time. So we, we will just monitor the uh, process memory usage in time. And actually, you can use it for any type of uh, process, not only for, uh, not only for uh, Python. But if you want to use it with Python, you should put uh, profile the creator for functions that you want to track and uh, run it with the option Python. And here I run some simulation. 
And here, are, here is the result. I got a plot. Uh, and here are, here we, we, I get the connect function marked as, as the, the one that does the op op operations here. So I see that probably uh, connect is responsible for the growth from here. And the run function is marked here. And as we can see, it doesn't change a lot from, uh, from our memory. And the third option for, uh, uh, for memory profiler is to use it as a, a debugger trigger. So we can set up a threshold of mem used memory and run our process. And then we will get, uh, we will step into the debugger when we reach the memory that we uh, set as the threshold. Uh, another one, another tool is object graph. It's a uh, cool tool for visualizing uh, object references in, in Python. Uh, and uh, actually for small projects, it's pretty cool because you get the, the such plots like this. Uh, it's uh, a good tool for finding uh, reference cycles in your, uh, in your code. But if your project is large enough, the plot that will be generated will be pretty large and it would be hard to track something there. But with uh, some code uh, manipulation, uh, there's all, all of this are, is in, in the tutorial of Object Graph, you can actually track down the object reference uh, cycles uh, pretty, pretty easily with this. Okay, the next two tools, probably there will be cover more in the third uh, talk uh, from this session, Hippie and Melia. Uh, they are a heap analysis uh, tool. They are pretty the same, uh, with some difference uh, that are pretty good described in, uh, in the, on, the, on the page of this project. Uh, so let's see what we can do with them. Mm, so we actually can run some code and do a heap snapshot here and do some more memory extensive, intensive operations and do another heap, shop snap, uh, heap snapshot. And uh, we actually can do some arithmetics on, on those heaps and get such a result. So we see that we allocated a lot of integers and list with this one operation. Uh, another tool uh, is a combination of Melia and Run Snake Run. So actually, you can use this tool to dump all the objects in your code and then use the rank snake mem uh, with the dump of memory that you did and get such interactive plot. So you can zoom in, zoom out to see uh, how, the ob how the memory is allocated for different, different objects. Okay, and this is almost end of my talk. So... Uh, you can also use different uh, uh, malloc implementations with Python. It's pretty easy. Uh, and you will find probably many block entries about using different uh, memory allocators. And uh, it's got some prompts. Uh, so uh, you can actually uh, gain uh, with a very little ingress uh, in, your, in your code uh, some additional, I don't know, Better, better memory uh, process to system memory retrieval. Uh, but uh, it got also cons, so actually it might work against you. So it depends from your application type. So if you want to use a uh, different uh, malloc implementation, you have to install, of course, the pro uh, different libraries. And then you can run the Python with LD preload and with the path to the uh, library you want to use. and you can get uh, different results. I actually prepared some small tests. Uh, so my code got some several steps and I used malloc, gem malloc and tc malloc uh, with the same code. And you can see how the memory changes in different cases. So as you can see for malloc, you actually, malloc is actually pretty good now on Python. There were some, a uh, uh, few years ago, there were some problems, but now, but now it works pretty, pretty good. But uh, as you can see with Gemlock, you can get pretty the same results and probably for different applications will, uh, you can gain something. But with TC malloc, for this, uh, this example, actually you end up with a little bit more memory allocated, not returned to the system. Uh, but again, this depends on the application type that you will, uh, of, of your application type. Some other useful tools. 
uh, you can always uh, you can always uh, build Python in debug mode. You can use uh, Valgrind with Python. It will pretty good cooperate with it. You can use the experimental extension for GDB, and probably uh, for most of uh, web developers, you can use one of Dozer of Dozer. Uh, Dozer is pro probably more. Uh, convenient because it's a WSGI middleware version of Cherry Pie memory, so this one, and you can just put it in your WSGI and uh, get some memory profiling. Uh, so summary, uh, try to understand better the underlying memory model, pay attention to hotspots, uh, use profiling tools, uh, seek and destroy, this is the actually the hardest part, so try to find the root cause and fix the memory leak, so probably the next, uh, next talk will be about uh, this. And there are some also some quick and dirty solutions, sometimes dirty. So you can delegate memory uh, into another the memory intensive operations and into another process, process it and collect the, the results, and then kill the process or stop the process. And you can actually regularly restart a process if it uh, generates too much memory overhead. And also you can always go for low hanging fruits like slots or try different memory allocations. Uh, here are some great references that I used uh, during pre when I was preparing this presentation, so give it a try. Some of them are outdated like this one, but they give a great insight about Python uh, memory insights. So thank you very much. Okay, I think we have some time for okay. uh, questions. So. Uh, please come to the microphone over there, it's a video team, if you have some questions. Hello, I've experienced it sometimes that uh, I've had uh, created many objects in Python and then uh, I removed all the references to them and actually forced the garbage collector on, Yeah. but the system memory still wasn't freed, so uh, um, does it just take some time or why does Python sometimes not free memory? Uh, it actually may depends from the version of your uh, Python interpreter. It, this is one, and second one, uh, it, the, sometimes the, the memory allocator will have problems with returning the memory. It's uh, a little bit more complicated, but you can try it, uh, Try the different memory allocation uh, libraries that I showed and try to see if the, it, it will help with, with your problem. Okay, thanks. Fragmentation Yeah, of course. Do you have any hints? You showed this uh, heapy and so on, I, I knew already. And do you have any hints how to debug off heap memory problems? So what I uh, experienced sometimes um, using PsychoPG2, like the whole process and was using like four gigabytes of memory, but heapy only showed um, very few uh, heap memory stuff. So I guess it was related with something, yeah. So the question is? <laughs> The question is, uh, do you have any um, hints how to um, debug uh, like this off-heap memory uh, problems? Mm. So you can, I don't know if you tried the debug version of Python, so compile it with the debug version and then you can see the uh, objects that weren't deallocated by uh, uh, garbage collector and uh, you can use Walgreens if you want to go uh, low level. So we can talk about it okay. in a moment. Okay, thank you very much, and now... Yeah.